So, AFL action is officially back for 2024. We have had one week of unofficial practice games, and in this video, I'm gonna try and summarize everything that's worth knowing about the week that was. Now, we do know it's only preseason games, and the results overall don't really matter, but that doesn't mean there aren't some things from each game that we can take note of. Some teams are doing a few different things structurally. They're obviously experimenting, but we're seeing new players in different roles for the first time. We're also seeing young stars crack it at AFL level for the first time, and there were a few standouts. So in this video, I'm gonna cover everything that I think is more or less worth knowing from the first week of action. Before we crack in, if you could do me a favor, 56% of the people that watch True Footy over the last month are subscribed. That number is as high as I can remember. So if you've been watching along and you are not yet subscribed, this would be a great AFL channel to subscribe to. So the first game took place about a week ago. The games were kind of staggered, but Melbourne took on Richmond and we saw Richmond win by about 23 points after four official quarters. But we know most of these games, they stretched out to six, seven, eight quarters of actual play. And things kind of got messy where, you know, a lot of young players were thrown around and top up players were in the action. But nonetheless, we saw Melbourne take on Richmond and both sides were missing a whole heap of key players due to, you know, recovering from injury, etc. But that doesn't mean that there weren't positive signs for both sides. In particular for Richmond, I think the the look of their new look forward line, particularly with Shai Bolton spending more time there. He kicked four goals in this game. Noah Bolter also kicked three goals as a key forward, and he lined up alongside Kaczynski, who also kicked two goals. So pretty good output for a forward line functioning without Tom Lynch. My boy Steely Green also put in a pretty solid performance and seems to be a bit of a dark horse to potentially play early in AFL 2024. And I will nominate Thompson Dow as well for doing some good work in the midfield. For the Demons, I think the biggest positive is that we saw Clayton Oliver take to the field. And we Obviously, there's been a lot of conjecture about what his 2024 is going to look like, but he played, I think, after the first four quarters had finished. Did some good things. Main point being, he's certainly in line to be there round one. And we also saw Cozzy Pickett roll through the midfield, which could be an important plus because I think since that game's been played, we've seen Angus Brayshaw retire and I do believe this could be a big year for Cozzy Pickett and if he adds some regular midfield rotations into his game he's going to become an even more dynamic player. Then North Melbourne took on Collingwood and the Roos ran out winners in this game 102 to 68 at least in the first four quarters. So for Collingwood you know one of the burning questions I had going into this season was what would their forward line look like in the absence of Dan McStay and it's made a really good start. Obviously it's only the preseason but we saw three goals each to Ash Johnson and Reef McInnes and those are two guys potentially fighting for the same spot in this team's forward line. Are we closer to an answer on which one starts round one? From the outside looking in, I'm not too sure. Perhaps Ash Johnson is still the favorite, but that will be an interesting battle and there's good competition for spots there. We also saw the Pies unearth a couple of SSP players that they've signed. In the midfielder, Lockie Sullivan, he played in the midfield and was influential and could potentially see games in 2024. And I did notice Jack Bytel, their other signing, the former St. Kilda inside mid, played on a halfback flank, which was interesting. For the Roos, one of the most exciting elements of this game, other than the fact that they won, it is preseason, but it's still nice to get a win in the preseason right? But Harry Sheasel, Zach Fisher, Colby McKercher, all distributing off halfback. That is an exciting backline. And while I have been vocal in what I think about their tall defensive situation, outside run and polish, those are the things we haven't seen from North Melbourne for the last little bit. And we know Sheasel was an absolute star, but add Colby McKercher, Zach Fisher into this mix, and it does give North Melbourne a new look. And we did see Nick Larkey also kick five goals. Paul Curtis kicked four. So it was a good hit out generally for the Roos. Carlton then took on Geelong at Icon Park, I believe it was, and we saw Geelong win this game by 17 points. The Cats, from what I can tell, fielded a fairly strong team. We did see a bit of action from their new draftee, Conor O'Sullivan, and Sean Manor. There was a bit of a scare early in this game. I think about eight seconds in, Cam Guthrie, who's arguably the, the midfielder they certainly can't afford to lose this season, pulls up with a bit of a quad injury, although it sounds like he was subbed off in a precautionary manner. So it should be all sweet. But in his absence, uh, there were some notable mentions of Tanner Brun and Jack Bowes through the midfield in this game. And the Cats ultimately overcame a slow start to kick 10 of the last 16 to win this game. Another interesting feature from this game is that Max Holmes, another player where I've speculated exactly what his role is going to be this year, started the game at halfback and was super impactful with his speed and accurate kicking. And then in the last quarter, moved into the midfield. So it will be an interesting watch to see what they do with Max Holmes this year. For the Blues, they're missing a few soldiers at the moment. We definitely saw them play with a bit more speed out of the back line than perhaps we were used to with this group. But it's also worth noting they've got a little bit of an injury situation bubbling away under the surface. So we know Sam Walsh is now on a modified program. I think he's still likely to play round one, but guys like Jack Martin, Owies, and Marchbank are all probably not going to be available for their first game against the Lions. And then there's also Jacob Wiedering at least out to round three. And we know Jack Silvani's done his ACL. So a little bit of pressure mounting, but on the plus side, Zach Williams 
who didn't play in this game should be available for opening round. There was a preseason Q clash between the Brisbane Lions and the Gold Coast Suns, and this game, more or less, at least by the scoreline, went how you'd expect an actual game to go between these two sides, with the Lions winning by 47 points. But some of the main takeaways from this game, we saw Cam Rayner played in a pretty much full-time midfield position and kind of stood out, which kind of creates a good selection headache for the Lions as to how they actually use him once the season starts. And I did also notice Darcy Gardner being played as a bit of a third tall up forward. So obviously Jack Gunson has left the club and they're still going to be tinkering with what that third tall forward position looks like. And while he didn't get a lot of stats, it sounds like he was okay. As far as the young guns go, there was a notable mention of how James Tunstall was really clean on the wing in this particular game and might be a bit of a bolter to play round one with obviously Ashcroft out of this team. That being said, Lockie Neal, who didn't play in this game, is likely to play in their next preseason game against Sydney, as is Jared Berry and Devin Robertson, Connor McKenna. Those guys are a week behind. So there may not be a spot available, but still good signs from a youngster. And for the Gold Coast Suns, Bailey Humphrey also gave a little bit of an indication he might take his game to the next level this year. While Alex Sexton was trialed as a halfback flanker for the first time in this game and a little bit rusty but you can see teams are really trying to find that sort of halfback distributor with good skills in each team and that seems to be Gold Coast go-to at the moment with Alex Sexton and you know fantasy watchers priced at about 380k I think if he moves into the back half he's probably going to find a bit more of the footy so keep an eye on that one. Then we saw a Sydney derby between Sydney and GW West with the Swans winning this game by 26 points. It was as far as I could tell pretty full strength sides. I think Toby Green missed this game. Taylor Adams also missed out but generally speaking two strong sides going head to head in a good preseason hit out we saw Brody Grundy play for the first time in red and white and apparently was pretty good against Kieran Briggs who has become a pretty good ruckman as far as takeaways from this game go I mean Isaac Heaney played a fair bit of midfield from the sounds of it it would be interesting to see how that dynamic works I do think Sydney kind of helped built up a fair bit of midfield depth it's better than I thought it was so Heaney perhaps just rolls through there as an impact player but for the Giants Lee Lear was talked about as being impressive he's kind of a top 20 pick from a few years ago that at least I haven't really heard much about since he got drafted. But also Aaron Cadman's an interesting watch from this. We expect him to play this year, potentially as that third tall alongside Riccardi and Hogan, but apparently was at some center bounce attendances. We know that prior to being drafted, he did spend some time as a genuine wingman before he transformed into a key forward. So are we going to see a key forward hybrid midfielder? That's going to be interesting to watch. St. Kilda also played Essendon and beat them pretty convincingly. So on the plus side for the Saints, we saw Darcy Wilson in particular, very impactful in this game, very quick, very skillful. We, we already know this about Darcy Wilson, but sometimes you never really know how a prospect's going to go at AFL level until you see him in the flesh and he had a crack in this game and was very good. But unfortunately, Marcus Windhager has a broken hand from this game, but still probably going to play round one, according to Robert Harvey. Interesting. And we also saw Riley Bonner play for the first time for his new club and was good off half back. Not a great performance from Essendon. That being said, it is just the preseason. We do need to keep that in mind. But we did see a bunch of their new recruits for the first time. Now, what happened, in, I think in the second quarter, that they weren't playing great already and then they decided to rest Zach Merritt, Jake Stringer, Todd Goldstein and their young prospect, Zach Reed. And that Zach Reed is going to be a player to watch this year. I'm intrigued to see how he goes as a genuine key back for this team alongside Ben Mackay. If he can establish himself as a best 22 player, that is a huge win for the Bombers. We saw Sardis deployed on a wing. I wasn't sure, you know, what exactly does their best 22 look like? Where does Sardis fit? He's kind of more of an on-baller rather than a wingman, but he is fast enough and has some outside game to be able to still impact in that role. And it sounds like he played there along with Xavier Dersman, the new recruit. And Nick Martin, previously the wingman, has been deployed on halfback and looked pretty comfortable in the role, which is not a surprise. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty excited to see how sharp showdowns go this year. I think Adelaide and Port are poised to have some really good contests. And fittingly, we saw a draw between these two guys in the first week of the preseason games. Now, one of the biggest things that came from it was Sam Pellpepper knocking out, I think it was Mark Keane uh, with a bump. So he's in doubt for round one. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, but for the Crows, I'll talk about guys like Riley Philthorpe. We're expecting him to incrementally improve. I think he's on a pretty solid trajectory at the moment. And at some point, there's going to need to be a button change in that forward line with Tex. And good start, kicked a couple of goals. And we also saw Ned McHenry kick three goals. Isaac Rankin kicked two goals. And the other thing with Rankin that's interesting about this is he seems to be playing increased time at center stoppages, which means more midfield time. And it'll be interesting to see how that affects his overall goal tally, but also the dynamic mix that it gives Adelaide there in their midfield. So we seem to be seeing that more, you know, small forwards giving the opportunity to run through center stoppages. Cosy Pickett, I've already talked about in this video. There's more. I know West Coast is doing it with Tyler Brockman. So I'm keen to see how that shapes up because we know Rankin did play midfield 
prior to getting drafted and is certainly skillful enough to do it. It was also good to see Mitch Georgiatis return to football action. He's obviously coming off that ACL that ended his season last year and from the sounds of it, didn't take part in the first four quarters but played in the last three and kicked three goals. So I'm hoping we see a good year from Georgiatis. I like him as a player. The Dogs got the job done over Hawthorne as well last week with a 108 to 83 win. Uh, it was an interesting one where the Bulldogs kind of spread their stars over the entire two games because they kind of played two games mished, mished together. Mished? But one standout for me was Riley Sanders and over time I'm starting to regret not talking about him more as a genuine rising star. I've already done my predictions. I can't take it back now but I really do think this kid is going to be set for a huge year because he's physically ready made. He's got a proven history of stepping up to new levels and performing well and he's got the tank and he kicked a great running goal so keep an eye on Sanders for sure if you weren't already going to. But just as pleasingly it's good to see Sam Darcy really start to show the talent that he's capable of at AFL level, even if it's just a preseason game. But he played the second ruck roll behind Tim English in this game and kicked three goals. And I think potentially that might make things awkward for Rory Lobb this year. I'm not sure exactly where that sits, but good to see a young future star of the comp start to elevate his game. And you just look at that future Bulldogs forward line and you think that tall timber is seriously powerful. For the Hawks, much has been said of their injury crisis. And we did see their new SSP signing Ethan Phillips, the key back. He entered the game after halftime. And it's interesting to see the backline dynamic they're working with at the moment. It's Ethan Phillips, at least in the second half. James Sisley, we already know about. But Jai Sarong as another one. I think he's drafted as a key forward. Caleb's younger brother, for anyone who's not aware. And uh, they might go with that sort of dynamic by round one. Hawks fans, let me know what the latest is on that. A couple of other interesting points. We saw Nick Watson play deep forward in this game. And didn't have the same impact that we know that he's capable of. So it'll be interesting one to watch. As a deep forward, he's probably going to struggle for genuine opportunities. I'd like to see him play higher, but they got a pretty deep forward line, so we can be patient with him. Uh, the other interesting one from this game, Blake Hardwick played forward, and this is one thing I didn't actually see coming. He's obviously predominantly a defender, but he played forward and kicked a couple of goals. So Hawks fans, again, let me know. I'd love to know the rationale for getting Hardwick forward when, you know, arguably the back line is in greater need considering Hawthorne's recruits. And finally, there was the Western Derby on Saturday, which we streamed on the Truefoot YouTube channel. Fremantle far too good with a 52 point victory. Now on my Eagles channel, I have done an Eagles reaction to that. It's called True Eagle and uh, go check it out if you want to see some specific Eagles content this year. For Fremantle, you know, it wasn't the most high intensity game, but from start to finish, particularly through the clearances, they were the stronger side. And, you know, in terms of individuals, I think Amos and Tracy certainly got a hold of the Eagles back line, certainly had more supply for a start. And that was largely in the first half, thanks to Nat Fife in particular, or at least I noticed him more in the first half. His ear marked for more midfield time as a genuine full-time midfielder as opposed to, you know, a forward like he's been previously. And while the Eagles aren't the strongest opposition, he still, you know, looked powerful and looks a little bit leaner as well. But one one guy that really stood out to me was Tom Emmett. In the absence of Lockie Schultz, you know, I have obviously highlighted Fremantle's forward line issues, but he looked damn good and could be there for round one. Fremantle's first pick last year, Cooper Simpson, also had a nice little cameo, kicked a set shot goal. and looks a very talented player, so potentially an outside chance for an early debut. I'm not sure exactly how likely it is for round one. For the Eagles, not too many individuals that stood out. Maybe Jaden Hunt and Jake Waterman would be the two. Jake Waterman in particular, I'll highlight because he's overcome terrible illness and has been one of the strongest performers for the Eagles in terms of preseason running. And he's carried that into the actual first game. So a real feel-good story, I think, there for Jake Waterman. He's overcome a bit. And I really do think he has a place in this Eagles side. But that's all I got for you right now, guys. Let me know in the comments what else you took away from this round of football. Again, I don't think it's so much about results. I don't think too much is going to be taken away from team performance. What we're really looking for is how players go in certain roles. Some teams had better weeks than others, no doubt. But let me know in the comments your takeaways. And for now, I'll thank you for watching. I'll thank you for being subscribed. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.